Alrighty, this is one of my favorite little experiments that I was been doing. This is the gearbox from my motorbike, actually. Well, not the gearbox. You know what I mean. Um, Six-speed, sequential, shifting, typical motorbike uh, gearbox. Uh, they're really interesting how they work. And in fact, I've set this one up. Um, so if I hide the shift drum uh, and some of these shift paths, um, it's actually quite handy to show how the gears are selected. And to do that, and just to sort of jump through quickly, uh, if we look at the back view here, and take it out of perspective mode just so you can see things squarely. Uh, I've got these three forks, these shift forks, and they engage on um, these little bearing surfaces which are oily. Uh, there's oil holes here and they actually get fed oil through the um, uh, through these channels um, so that they can stay, uh, stay healthy. All right. Uh, back to here. Now these forks are actuated by these little pegs which go in that shift drum that I just uh, hid from view and it's going to push these back and forward and obviously very synchronized so that they uh, they push and pull in the right, at the right time. <clears throat> and so this is um, these big notches here they impinge on these big notches here. This is the dogs and the ears of the clutch um, of the uh, of the drive, and that's how these splined gears, which are these ones on these big splines here, will always turn with the shaft. Whereas the freewheeling gears um, that transmit load from of torque from one shaft to the other uh, will be only actuated when these ears um, are in contact with each other. Anyway, that's a really basic and poor explanation of how these marvelous devices work. Anyway. To show how they work a little bit better, I can use a capability called name positions. So I have calculated the positions uh, that they would be. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of mates down here, um, you know, so that they drive each other, and, and you know, there's re revolutes and fastens and sliders and all the things that you know make this thing physically work. You know, so on shapes mates work in a very physical way uh, rather than using kind of abstract geometry to align three faces and uh, you know this vertex is aligned with another they're uh, set up in in ways which are physical like a slider in these two axes or a ball joint between these two uh, parts um, centered around this center of these spheres anyway you can just easily create a number of name positions and apply them and you'll see that I've applied first gear. <laughs> so you can see if I go back to neutral um, that this one is moving in. So this splined gear with this light blue one is going to lock up this one, which is um, which is freewheeling on a journal bearing. And then once it starts locking this one, then the gear, the the um, this is where the clutch is, this is where the input of the torque is. It will come through this tooth, now into this, you know, through this one, now into this one, and now it's locked to the orange shaft, so it goes out the output where the sprocket and the chain is over here. So that's first gear. Um, second gear is the other one. So this one uh, will engage all the way through uh, to this one here, and the um, uh, so the the torque is now into second gear. Third gear, fourth gear. And fifth and sixth are controlled by this slider up the top. There we go. So we've gone through all the gears, and now that is uh, is kind of handy sometimes to uh, to explain um, uh, how these how these things work. Now the other interesting thing, the bit that I actually wanted to show you, was this thread. This is where the clutch. Uh, pack goes on. There's a big spline um, here that is obviously mirrored in the uh, in the clutch pack, uh, and this is a thread, which is like an um, an M20 thread, and it's pretty detailed, and it takes a little bit of modelling. And in doing so, you know, you're really not adding that much to um, yeah, other than just 
eye candy in some ways. Uh, so another approach is what I've done over here. So I've derived this part um, from the original drive shaft, which is what this derive feature is. I'm in a new document, by the way. So a derive feature is linked to a version of that um, document, of that part in the document that, that we looked at before. Um, if that ever changes, it will tell me that this is out of date. Do I want to go to a new version? Um, but otherwise, this, this document will remain uh, mine to work in. Interesting piece of uh, geometry. This is actually pretty accurate. Um, you can see the big gallery down the middle where oil is allowed to flow up into certain journals. Um, uh, so it comes out of this one here. Um, let's have a, like, another look at sorry the, uh, the cross section through here. I just hit Shift X all the time, and you can see where those. Uh, okay, this way is better. Yeah, 90 degrees. So oil is allowed to flow freely in and out of these uh, here where this is where the journals are for the um, for the other bearings. Anyhow, uh, what I've done is take off that big spline and uh, which of these features here, and I've taken off the thread as well because something that you might want to do, uh, and it's a good practice generally, is to not have to model the 3D nature of the threads. You can actually model them as a uh, an external thread. Uh, which is going to appear with the right metadata or right model data, um, but it doesn't actually have to cut the 3D geometry. So here, all I have to do is choose that edge at the top there. And it's a really simple selection. Um, it's, there's a couple of different standards. It's going to choose from an ANSI or an ISO threads. It's picked that this is an M20 already based on the diameter, the closest diameter to the standard. Um, to M20, and uh, there's a different, there's a bunch of different pitches that are in, uh, you know, whether ultra fine or coarse or fine threads. Um, in this case, we're going to go two and a half. The length of the thread, the threaded area, uh, is going to be either a blind length, or we could choose it to let it go to next, uh, and it's going to choose the next logical place to keep the thread going. And in fact, we do want this blind, and we do want it 10 millimeters. So just so it happens. Uh, I will want it to split the face so that I can have you know, a nice line that appears for me uh, for drawing purposes or other uh, purposes. And the other interesting thing is we can add a chamfer um, automatically or included in this feature. You know, there's the chamfer on the, the, the tip there. And in fact, you can also add an undercut. Um, and these undercuts are, the diameters can be changed and the length and the, uh, the angle of the of the chamfer can be changed, uh, but these are just coming um, automatically based on these numbers up here. Um, it will choose the, the appropriate ones. You can, of course, override them. So if I just keep the chamfer, um, and there we go. So if I highlight this feature, it will highlight that where the threaded portion is. Uh, but other than that, you know, I haven't added really any, any weight to the model um, whatsoever. Uh, it's just a very, very small amount of property and uh, model data that can be picked up uh, downstream. So now I'm going to uh, alter the end and you know, bring back my um, uh, my spline in here. And if you see here that the uh, the threaded portion still survives, you can see where the threads uh, if you were, and you can think see how it uh, was in the the fully detailed model. Um, you know you get the same amount of information out of here. So I go to a drawing of this, and if I update the drawing, I'm going to, because I've just sort of laid out the views and perhaps a, a detail um, area from it before, um, I could show some whole callouts. So if I pick this edge of the thread, it's, you're seeing it's pulled out to the M20 by 2.5 thread. Um, we might want to put an additional uh, dimension on the on the length of this that's the 10 and there's actually another hole in the end here um, I'll show you that this whole feature is um, is a pretty nice one we've we've done a lot of work on whole features over the last year or so now um, we've added a whole lot of new 
options for the extent or the length of the hole, um, not just blind or through all, but we can do through next or up to next and up to certain entities now. Uh, we've also added tolerancing on any of the dimensions. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to add tolerance, um, you can say, give me a sort of symmetrical tolerance of you know, 0.3 or something uh, on the diameter of the drill, the drill diameter of that hole. Um, you can do it also for the, the countersink and the, um, any of the dimensions that you set for the hole. Uh, we can also change the tip um, drill tip angle uh, from 118 through to anything or even a, a flat or custom uh, as well. So yeah, a lot more control on holes. Um, in fact, if you're threading a hole, if you've got a threaded or tapped hole, uh, you'll see now that we can add th thread classes uh, to these holes as well. So you can choose um, for the 6H or whatever else you want to do for a thread class. Uh, but in this case, it's a clearance hole. Uh, it's actually not really a very important hole. Um, it's, well, it's an important one to have, but it's, uh, the depth of it is not. Uh, it is really only for holding the, uh, uh, the center of it in a, um, in a turning operation that, that happened before it. That's its utility. So now we've got this hole. Um, we go back to the drawing. Let's update it because we have changed it a little bit. And now I'm going to use the call out on the hole. And you see here that it's, um, we've got the five and a half millimeter drill diameter with its tolerance of symmetrical tolerance, its depth, the countersink, and the shape of the countersink as well. So those, um, those are all just available um, through that directly in the drawing now. So we've got all the information we need to manufacture this thing and uh, we have a very lightweight and efficient model over here.